Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit and life within us. We receive what you have to say to us today. Within Jesus, amen. We've been talking about humility and the differences in the, the words. I, I cannot tell you, and this is, I think, what people freak out. I cannot tell you how to be a humble person because I'm not a humble person. can't do that. But I can tell you the experience, the testimony that the Lord did in me to uh, show me and bring my, my eyes open and listen to his spirit on a way to do what the Bible actually says we're to do, which is to humble yourself. Humble yourself. It doesn't say to be a humble person. It says to humble yourself. And humility is a walk into covenant. It's a walk into death of self, unselfish service to God and to others. At this time, the time that, that, that I was going through this, the Lord was taking me through it, telling me to teach it, I thought, brother. Um, but I finally began to understand. It had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with me yielding myself to Yeshua and the Spirit of the living God doing these things in me. Not changing me. No, I'm still worthless. Nothing good dwells in me. But what the Lord did in putting, opening my eyes to things I'd never seen and reminding me through many years, just I'd be minding my own business and and the Lord would speak and he'd say, you need to humble yourself. Be, be, how do you humble yourself in this situation? And I want to talk a little bit about that from the section of Scripture that the Lord was taking me through at that time, which is 1 Corinthians 13. You cannot separate agape love from humbling yourself. Because in many ways, they're pretty close to the same thing. Agape love is much broader. But if you're going to agape love, you're going to have God as love. It's not, it's not that you're going to be more loving. It's that you're more yielded. Um, it's not that you're the world's greatest love person. It's that you're simply letting God live his life through you. And at that time, I was memorizing, meditating on 1 Corinthians 13. And the Lord would just open my eyes to different things. If you, the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13, you can put, in, when you're meditating on words, you put things in the first person. Um, Yahweh says, you will have no other gods before me. Put it in the first person. It becomes a prayer. Now, I will have no other gods before you. God being love, the first three verses, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I've become a noisy gong, a clangy cymbal. And if I have gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I sell all my goods to give to the poor, and deliver up my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Now see, it's right there. You cannot put that in the third person. Love is patient. But if I say something like, I am patient, 
I begin to fall apart laughing. If I were to quote it to you, Michael Davis's patient, there, there would be just a general falling apart of the audience. Um, I'd be known as the greatest comedian ever stand up and a liar. I'm, I could go into politics. Um, love is patient, love is kind, is not jealous, does not brag, is not arrogant. He began to use these words in my life to correct me and remind me that I needed to be yielded to him. In so many ways, it was a brutal time. Love does not brag, is not arrogant, does not take, does not act unbecomingly, does not seek its own. Is that right? Does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are are gifts of prophecy, they will cease. If there are tongues, they will be done away. If there is the gift of, I forgot what it was. What is it? Um, I think that's all. Oh, pro uh, prophet, knowledge. Knowledge. Yeah. That's actually one of my favorites. Um, if there's knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. When the perfect comes, the partial shall be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, we see in a mirror dimly, then face to face. Now, we know in part, but then I shall be, I shall, mess it up, um, then I shall know just as I have been fully known. Now by these three, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. You could, you could put the word humility Every time that I said the word love, humility is patient. Why? Because it's suddenly not about me. Humility is kind. Why? Because it's suddenly not about me. Is not jealous. Why? Because it's suddenly not about me. When God tells us, humble yourself, He's simply asking each one of us for an avenue for him to come in and develop the life of his son to flow through us. When I was first looking through 1 Corinthians 13, remember it starts out with if. If. One of the most unconsidered words in our society. I have to tell you as far as speaking in, in saying things, if wasn't part of me. It was simply that I would. I had to learn to listen. It's one of the things we talk about, the most important part of love is patient. The most patient thing I can do is learn to listen to other people. I'll say it again. The most patient thing that I can do is learn to listen to others. We are so often in a hurry. We've got, we got to get this done. Why? I understand if there's a time limit on it, fine. But most of the stuff we have time limits on are artificial and only cause strife. If I speak, how ridiculous. Of course I speak. That was a problem. Um, most of the time in situations that we hear most of the time we will go okay how can I fix that um, 
Guys certainly do that. Um, there's a problem, fix it. Um, do we ever stop and ask ourselves, should I fix it? Should I be part of it? Should I say anything? I have discovered, much to my shock and dismay, that the world is not sitting around waiting to hear my every word. I had to laugh again at our friends at Babylon B. A few weeks back, they had an article stating that scientists had uh, been doing a lot of research and they found that actually, in fact, you were the most important person in the world and that the things that you said, the world is waiting to hear constantly and, uh, and that you should be rightfully given your power to rule the world. Uh, it was actually a very funny article as, and, and of course, somebody that's writing that has to be selfish enough to write it. They have to be able to look in their, in their self and go, oh, and so I laughed at that. But we think about Moses. He was the one, and he knew it. He's supposed to be the leader, the one that's going to get him out of there. And uh, he didn't know that was going to be with God's power. He thought it was his power. And it led to murder. He murdered a man, dug a shallow grave for him, Again, it's us doing things in our own strength. Quite a few years ago, the father called me up and we were just talking. I said, well, how are, how are things going? He said, okay, except for this one daughter. He said, she is openly rebellious. She won't do what we tell her. And Whenever I get her in, and I, I, I'll get her into a room somewhere, and I'll sit her down, and as he put it, I'll read her the riot act. Uh, and he said, and she sits there with this glazed look over her face. As soon as I start talking, I mean, she didn't pay any attention at all. It's the way of rebels. He said, what am I supposed to do about that? I said, what are the things in my own life that I look back on with a lot of anguish is the, is the only word. And it's pretty much every day that, that some of these thoughts will come. Is how I've, how I acted uh, as a father to the children because I was so selfish it's so much about me that I would not even not knowing that I did it but I would use the kids to show that you know I, I was doing an okay job I said one of the things that just grieves me now is to go to some of these conferences and some dad is chewing these kids out and you can tell his main concern is not the child. The main concern is how he looks. And he will attack his children to make sure he looks okay. And it was silent when I finished saying that. And he said, guilty. I said, so am I. He realized that this rebel had figured something out. God only wanted, I mean, the, the father only wanted her to be good for his sake, not for the right reasons. The second verse, if I have the gift, I've watched this so often, and it, slide over into me. The Holy Spirit gives us gifts, folks. He gives us gifts. But it's a gift. And it's done 
and his prerogative. I cannot just conjure up, okay, speak to us now, Holy Spirit, because we've said the right words and you have to. So often that I've seen the gifts in the Spirit have been so often about somebody showing off. Somebody going, look at me. I've got this gift. Look at me. I did this. Um, told the story before about the man. He didn't come to church very often. He was a big fellow. Big. My goodness, he was big. He was an attorney in town, so he also had big power. Town of about 2,000. Maybe three. But he was a, a big man. And one day, as is the church's want, there was some kind of commercial from the podium of the pastor and potentate um, that we needed to give more money to the church because they were doing some kind of deal. This guy had come to church that day, and as, again, was his want, he would come in late, and then there wouldn't be any seats. That's a Baptist church. There's no seats in the back. Um, and he would have to walk down to the front, which he, was part of his ploy. You get the feeling. Well, the pastor's talking about this missionary offering or whatever it is, and you, he's down on the first row. And you suddenly see these hands go up, come back down. And of course, you, you, we, we turn toward movement. And he's doing this, and he pulls out his, I'm serious, he pulls out his checkbook. Preacher's sitting there talking. Preacher didn't see him. Everybody else did. He writes his check, and you hear it. I don't know if he had an amplifier on the checkbook or not, but you could hear it all the way in the back. Rip! And he stands up. Guy, they've not, they've not passed the plate or anything. He walks up to the altar before Pastor Potentate and puts it in the uh, the plates before they're passed around, making making sure that. I mean, it's a wonder he, he did everything except blow the trumpets. <coughs> and as I said, I mean, it's, it's like trying to hide a polar bear against a black background. He's all this movement and all this stuff. I've done the same thing without the checkbook, trying to show off. You know, God made some of us, some of us, more intelligent, uh, some with more money, some more gifted, some uh, more attractive. But why would He do such a thing? Honestly, most of us use these gifts to serve self, to manipulate others, to put that power against them somehow, rather than serving others with the gift. If I speak, if I have this gift, learn to listen, learn to not say, Okay, now this is going to be tough, some of you. But when somebody says, oh, X plus Y equals Z. And then we go, yeah, I know, I know. I had a boss one time that was showing me how to do something. And... It was, this was the Lord. My goodness, this was the Lord. I remember stop and listening, and he was showing me how to do something that I'd been already doing for a while. 
And when I started doing uh, the task, he was shocked and thought he was really the world's greatest teacher because I could suddenly do this thing that he was trying to teach me a few minutes before. And I didn't, I didn't say, I know how to do that. I thought, this is the boss. I learned from the second, second command, actually. And he said, wow, you learned how to do this. You sure you haven't done this before? Um, I said, well, now, now he's asked me a direct question. Um, I can't just lie because I've been doing it. I said, well, actually, the boss showed me how to do it a while back. Really? Wow. Why didn't you tell me? And this is not me. I, I mean, I still look back at it and go, where did that come from? I found coming out of my mouth because I thought you might tell me something that I didn't know. So I listened. You could tell I went from way down here to way up there as far as he was concerned. Why? I just listened. It's just listened. I just shut up and listened. Sorry. The deplorable word. Okay, as long as it's about me shutting up, it's okay. <laughs> um, again, Moses, the most humble man around, was very gifted, rich, talented, and uh, but trouble and arrogance when he used these gifts for himself and applied wrongly, wrongly uh, in being in love with himself. The third verse, if I give all my possessions, the kingdom of God is not a worldly kingdom with blaring trumpets and great fanfare. Good works are to only come from God in me and telling me to do those. They're not mine. I'm afraid we all have this idea. Well, I'm coming to God to get in this self-improvement program, and that's not what it is. It's the less of self that's an improvement. The kingdom of God is made up of many dwelling places, individuals. And we've got where we think that you have to be in a mega church and, and, and not a small congregation. Small congregations are just fine. Um, I was talking to a man a while back, it's a part-time pastor, and uh, he said they have about six people that attend their church in a church building. And they do churchy things there, but they've only got six people. Um, you know what? It's okay. In the area this person is in, that's probably doing pretty well. Uh, but mega churches, and I've, I've heard them say it a number of times. Oh, there's so much good we can do when we're all together. Now, does anybody recognize what's being said there? Tower of Babel. Remember the Tower of Babel? And they're building this up to heaven. And Yahweh looks at it and goes, if we don't stop that, they're going to be capable of doing anything. And he scattered them at that time. He said nothing will be impossible to them. And we think that if we've got a lot of people, that the inertia of it or the the strength of this many people and all of their money is going to get the job done. And that may be so, but it won't be done in the name of the Lord. It'll be done in the name of that church, name of that pastor. Even in death, it's going to sound odd, death can be a prideful thing. The reason I bring that up is because suicide is at an epidemic proportion in our society. Uh, I, I hate to actually say this, but I'm pretty sure suicide is actually the number one killer of young men up into their 30s. The number one killer? Are you kidding? Well, why? They have nothing to live for. They don't have anything to live for. They understand that. Because the church, maybe it's taught them to do that, but uh, certainly our society and our school districts, our schools have taught them, you are su you, all you are is an accident. 
That's all. We, we could have cut you out as a tumor when you were a baby. We should have. And even well, people that commit suicide, it's, it's often, I don't want to say always, often the final act of a selfish person saying they have also the power of death. It was interesting that Moses had these gifts. If I have the gift. Moses had a lot of gifts, but God had to take him out of there and away from the place that his gifts would not matter at all. Left, left a lot of it behind in Egypt. And he had to learn how to take care of sheep and to be poor. So now we come to the list. Love. In this case, it's humility. Humility is patient. Patient. Will I just... It's funny because young men may come, they're about to get married. What, would you, what advice would you give? What advice? Well, obviously, getting into God's Word. But I'm, I, I, look at, I look at that guy and I, and I said, if, if you're... If you're not meditating, you're all, you're all messed up. But I'm going to say one other thing that you need to do, and that's shut up. And so Davis would reach over and whack me for saying that because it's a deplorable word. But the guy needed to hear it. Shut up! Quit thinking you need to fix everything. You're going to fix your wife. Uh, uh, years ago, I saw this cartoon where this guy had his girlfriend, and they were getting serious. And uh, he brought the list of things she needed to fix in her life so that she would be a perfect uh, 10 and handed it to her. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Was my list not accurate? <laughs> anyway. T took this sorry. list and these are the things we need to work on here. And she looks at it and says, Wow. I didn't know I was this broken. And he said, oh, not broken, you just need a little tweaking here and there. Shut up. <laughs> uh, wait on God. Moses was with sheep 40 years, with rebels another 40 years. It just went on and on. <laughs> Seems like it. And... Uh, and for the most part, we really do see Moses acting in a very patient way. Impatience, and you're not going to like me for this because I know how all of us enjoy being impatient. I don't know what it is, but something about it. Just I, I'm in charge here. You need to go over here and do this. Um, but like I said, this was brutal. Impatience is always self-centered and always prideful. Impatience is always self-centered and always prideful. Now, let me tell you, there's a difference between impatience and imperative. When the, pa the parent sees that kid run out into the road without looking, and you hear the screech of tires, and the kid got missed, I can promise you that the first thing out of that parent's mouth toward that child is not going to be, I'm glad you're okay. They're going to be going, what were you doing? And they would yell. They would yell, stop it! And there's a reason to stop it. Uh, that's the imperative. The impatience is spanking them afterwards for not something that you didn't tell them not to do that they can't get, they're just a child. Um, the imperative doesn't get to be used very often if we, if we actually understood it. We often claim that it's imperative when it's actually impatience. Now this is another weird one. Love is patient, love is kind. When God was bothering me about this, and he still does it, he still does it, it's just it's changed a little bit. I worked in this building it was more like a prairie dog town 
because what they had done is they put us all in these cubicles. You know, a cubicle, if you've never experienced it, is like a prairie dog town. Um, everybody's head hits it right about here. You know, I mean, it, it, there's taller, there's shorter, uh, but you can just see over the top of these things, and if they something happens, well, the head pops up everywhere. I mean, it's these little heads everywhere out through there. And, uh, but, and so it's like walking through a maze in a lot of ways. And, and if you don't believe that you're a rat, you don't understand because you are. And uh, I remember one day walking through this maze. And this is when God is bothering me about this. And he says, uh, you need to smile. Smile. Why? Look here. I'm in, I'm in this rat maze. And there's not, there's not another rat around. I'm alone. Okay. But I said I wanted you to smile. You know, it's one of those things like Peter. Well, because you said so, I'll do it. But there's nobody there. And I thought, if somebody sees me smiling, you know, he's off by himself and he's just smiling. And <laughs> look, at all, look at all this crowd of people everywhere hallucinating. And, and I said, okay, fine. I put on a smile, and the second I did, another a rat a person popped out from the rat maze, pow, into my area. I'm walking, and the first thing they saw on my face was a smile, and they smiled back. This is weird. Uh, God began to bother me about that, Whenever uh, we wind up going someplace public or something like that, he will remind me, I want you to smile. Fine. But, you know, you're, you're always, I think some of the stuff that I thought, what if they think I'm trying to manipulate them or come across at them or something like that? And he said, that's not your business. And... I said, but some of these people don't want to smile. There was one in particular that um, wasn't going to. And um, this person had a particular sin in their life. They were very angry, upset all the time. And I said, I'm supposed to smile for that one too? And he's, he said, if you greet your brothers only, if you greet your brothers only, uh, it was a very angry woman, and she was as far from being my brother as it could be, because I'm, I'm not supposed to be greeting my brothers only, but also so my sisters, my, my whatever, uh, you know, um, to smile and say hello is sometimes difficult, but it needs to be that we we understand we don't have to be you know, it's religion time. There are reasons that one, you have control over yourself. Um, but a little kindness, the Lord would remind me, didn't hurt me too much.